Okay, so good afternoon or good evening to those in the UK uh, for the annual general meeting of Late Orient Football Club. Um, and uh, we're going to go through a relatively informal but also formal agenda. I'm going to open the meeting and welcome the directors who are present. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit of formal business that you need to do in the annual meetings. Um, and then I'll say a few words. Uh, Kent's going to say a, a few words. Then Mark Devlin will talk. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A. And I want to remind everyone, this is a financial annual general meeting. It's not, if you like, why has this player not been signed and that player, where's he stand? So this is more on the business of the club. And we will finish it. This is our first formal uh, virtual annual general meeting. Normally we do it kind of in a mixed way, live and virtual, but with all the celebrations, um, I think uh, this is probably going to be the way going forward. Here in the States, nearly everyone has done, this is for companies, their annual meeting uh, in such a way. And for those who don't know, the attendance we have today far exceeds any big company attendance in America. So this tends to be just a, a, a formal uh, arrangement. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome the board members who are on the call today. Uh, firstly, our Vice Chairman, Kent Teague. Uh, secondly, I'm looking through, we've got uh, Marshall Taylor. Yeah. Then we ha have Matt Porter, who, as he said, is in the Caribbean. Um and then we have other senior management representatives, Lindsay Martin, our club secretary, uh, who has just returned from an exotic trip to Japan. Uh, Mark Devlin, our CEO. Martin Ling, our director of football. And Simon Blake, our independent financial advisor to the board and the club. So what I'd like to do first is go into the formal business and we don't normally have a lot of formal business, um, but we did have one piece this year, uh, which is a new EFL regulation it was sent out to all shareholders. I've got it in front of me. So to save anyone looking it up, uh, it's a new couple of clauses which the EFL asked every club to put in. Um, it's the part of tightening up on who owns football clubs, which for those interested in the fan-led review and the proposed legislation, I think this is a step in the right direction. So let me just read it. It's 44.2 and 44.3. Without prejudice to the provisions of Article 43, the directors may refuse to register the transfer of any shares in the event that, then there's some sub-clauses, the Football League Limited has not provided the transferee with all the necessary confirmations and approvals as required by the owners and directors test contained in Appendix 3 of the EFL regulations as updated from time to time, or any equivalent provisions of the EFL regulations as updated from time to time. I think that means the same thing, but anyway. And then the second clause is Registering the transfer of the share or shares will cause the company to breach any regulation, any football association rule, Premier League rule, or any other equivalent provision of any regulatory authority to which the club is subject. And I think I'd say as part of the proposed legislation, there is a license scheme coming out. So this is gradually getting us there. And then 44.3 said, except as required by law, no person is to be recognised by the company is holding any share upon any trust and except as otherwise required by law or in the articles, the company is not in any way to be bound by or recognize any interest in any in, in a share other than the holder's absolute ownership of it all and all the relight, all the rights attaching to it. That's to make sure that people don't claim shares that they don't own effectively, even though there's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo there. So um, obviously, that was sent out three weeks ago, and I want to say uh, the provision to our bylaws there, um, sorry, our Articles of Association was 
approved. Um, so that's the formal part of our business. Um, so I'll close that part of the meeting and move on to uh, the year that is under review for Lake Orient Football Club Limited, which is the 30th of June, 22 is when it ended. Seems a long time ago because it's nearly a year. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things I had in my uh, report. Firstly, the 21-22 season was a mixed one on the pitch. Um, and then I talk about Kennedy Jacket, Matt Harold doing a great job holding the fault. And then we appointed Richie Wellens in March of 22. And we finished the season comfortably in mid-table. Um, and I said at the time, we remain optimistic. And as we wrote the report, we were actually getting towards the end of this season. So um, we are very happy to say that that clearly was a successful season. So I'll I'll come back to that in a moment. On the business side, as I said, our losses remain stubbornly and disappointingly high, but we're optimistic that Mark Devlin, who was appointed uh, something like 15 months ago, will sort that out. Um, I think Mark's going to be very aggressive in creating commercial opportunities and with that, the revenue that comes with it. Uh, we have a deal that probably Mark will touch on later with Tottenham Hotspur, and he will also, I'm sure, talk about the new hybrid pitch, which is probably everyone associated with Lake Norian knows is currently underway. Um, I also said in my report that there's going to be clearly a lot of change in football finances in the next couple of years. Uh, clearly, we had the fan-led review, and leading to that, the proposed legislation by the government uh, supported very strongly and probably even more aggressively by the Labour Party, uh, as also the redistribution of broadcasting income from the Premier League under discussion and the new EFL broadcasting deal, which was launched um, about three weeks ago and should have a very positive Im impact on the finances of the lower league clubs. So that was the kind of comments I made in our report. Um, I want to just segue to update you all, much of which I'm sure you know. Uh, we had a very, success, very successful season on the pitch. We have congratulated ourselves ad nauseum. Um, and uh, one thing I would say is uh, celebrating is hard work. But anyway, uh, we've now got through the celebrations. We're planning for the new season. Um, and obviously, this is the time of year when players and agents and coaches are on holiday, getting ready to come back, and we return to training at the end of the month. Um, we kind of had an interesting scenario as a club in that we had a six-year plan, and we achieved it. We got back to where we came from, and that doesn't happen too often. So we had a little bit of a uh, think about how to progress and essentially, the elements of the three-year plan, which we've now adopted and has been discussed a lot at the board level, is that we move forward, try and consolidate in League One, build our infrastructure that Mark will touch on, and you know, at some stage in the next three, four years, hopefully, we we'll aspire to the championship. I think it's worth saying that Luton is an aspiration to us all, um, and I know we're going to have questions about the stadium. I remind everyone that Luton's current stadium holds 10,000. Um, ours holds 9,200, a bit less than that because of some safety restrictions. And another inspiration is Bournemouth. Bournemouth has a stadium of 11,000, and they're obviously in the Premier League, and congratulations to them for staying up. So a lot to think about, a lot of money to be spent, and... You know, one of the things I've learned about running a football club is it's fun, it's exciting, and when you've supported it for 54 years, uh, you never lose that excitement, but it's very costly. And a, a number of us are losing money in our pockets every year. Um, so that's something that needs resolving. And this meeting is probably good by coincidence in that Mark is phoning in from the uh, annual meeting of the EFL, which 
I would I normally go to and like going to, but I've got graduating activities in the household here in Boston. Um, so Mark may even be updating me as well as you when he speaks. So that's my report. I look forward with optimism. Um, I look forward to keeping Richie as our head coach. I want to call out Martin because for those who were on before we actually started, Martin has had a total of nine promotions. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say in our ownership of the club has had a very good period as, as he took us out the National League as champions, then took us out League Two as champions. And for someone who is surrounded by people every day over here who talk about Wrexham, we're still one division ahead of Wrexham. So with that, I'm looking forward to the new season. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone, probably not until August. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass over to Kent for a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would also say that we are now one league above Salford, but that's just me. And uh, the other thing, the other thing I would say is, is that Nigel, while celebrating is a lot of work, I've got one more planned. It's either going to be August the 5th or August the 12th. I don't know which one it's going to be. First home game in League One. I'm planning on us having at least a little bit of a celebration, another celebration. So super proud of what we've accomplished. Um, we continue to operate the business uh, as efficiently and effectively as I think we can. Um, we continue to lose money every year, but that's kind of what we knew we were up against. And that's kind of the way the leagues are all constructed below the Premier League. So it kind of is what it is. Um, all I would say, uh, kind of, Last remark would be thanks to all of you that are season ticket holders or season card holders. I never can get English correct, as you know. And so, again, we just appreciate the support uh, that we got this last year, the attendances that we had, uh, everybody coming out, supporting the club, not only home, but also away, our away travel was fantastic this year so again thanks to everybody and um look forward to next year Ken, thank you very much and breaking news i'm sure all our fans will be really disappointed to know that messi will not be joining us martin failed in his quest and it's just been announced that he's going to the mls into milan so martin you need to work a bit harder next time um so I'm going to pass over to Mark. It might, it might be Inter Miami, not Inter Milan. But anyway. Did I say Inter Milan? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you said Inter Milan, I think. I think it's Miami. I think Beckham is the one that got him. And, oh, and going back to Salford, they also fired Phil Neville last week. But anyway. Um, so, Mark. Uh, uh, thanks, Nigel. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, evening, everyone from uh, sunny Chester. Um, let me just bring you a, a little bit up to speed. So Nigel and Kent have touched on the success of the last six years and definitely from a playing perspective, uh, undoubtedly the, the club has been successful and achieved its ambition um, in terms of returning to, to League One and with a, um, a good degree of stability. Talking to some of the people up here, there are lots of financial issues uh, in, the, um, in the football world. Lots of clubs who are hanging on by their uh, fingertips. Wrong of me to say any of them. Some of them are out in the public domain. Um, I think a source of comfort to Orient fans should be the ownership uh, of, of the club, the people that are vested in it, um, and listening to some of the issues that a number of clubs uh, are having. One of the reasons why the Football League are really trying to tighten up even further on the owners and directors' rules. Um, is that you know there are some serious problems about, uh, throughout football. Some of that will be assisted by uh, the fan-led review and the outcomes of that, and we're told that that is inching towards an agreement. The Premier League is still playing hardball, but we should see more money falling into the Football League um, and being better distributed down into the Football League. The next challenge, which was also discussed at the League One meeting, was how that might be better um, and, and slightly more evenly spread out amongst the Championship League One and League Two clubs. 
Um, again, without boring everyone with the details, the overwhelming majority of money that flows into the football leagues uh, goes into the championship. They are the drivers behind the uh, TV deal after all. Um, but there needs to be a little bit more. Uh, there needs to be, it needs to be a bit more equitable. And whilst we're talking about the Premier League being more equitable, it's a good time for the Football League internally to be more equitable. So that's being discussed today and obviously officially announced the new Skybet deal, which will bring more money into clubs um, going forward. Uh, and I, I think I believe there are a few questions uh, later on that have already come into the club about the TV deal and, and what that may or may not mean for, for the club itself. So lots of good stuff going on. But I, I think it's important that the, the, um, the challenge I have, along with uh, a, a really, really good group of staff and obviously the board, is to match the success on the field with financial success off it. And financial success for us will be obviously reducing our losses down to something that is much more manageable and one day achieving um, a break-even situation. Uh, that's some way off for pretty much every club. Uh, but, you know, we have to work harder at that. And some of the things we've done over the past year have been to bring finance in-house, to introduce much more robust financial processes. Um, that hasn't always gone down well with people who I have to say have probably uh, uh, ridden the wave of generosity from the club in the past. I'll touch on that in a minute, but we've had to do that. We've had to professionalise our systems behind the scenes, and there's still lots of work to do there. And from a financial, pro you know, whilst we have brought things in house and we have much more robust financial processes, we still have a long way to put our house completely in order. And that's um, probably my 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 single most challenge. Whilst we've now recruited people into some uh, some really good people into some of the senior roles. For instance, Ravi Patel, who's joined us at the beginning of May as our chief commercial officer, uh, already making some really good progress in terms of some major partnerships. And we hope to be able to announce those, you know, we're imminently within, with, within weeks. We've got some good conversations going on. So part of my job has been to change the mentality around the club from thinking of ourselves as little old Lake Orient and being happy to be given and taking whatever it is that's thrown at us, whatever crumbs come at us from a, a commercial point of view, we're being a bit more robust. I don't mind saying that we've turned down a um, stadium naming rights deal that didn't meet, that didn't, A, didn't meet really what we were looking for in terms of finances, uh, but also B, basically the, the people concerned um, tried to change the deal at the last minute. And I think the days where we can be taken for a ride have, have come and gone. Um, we're a we're a, a good, solid London uh, football club, and we need to um, we need to have pride in what what the club's all about. We do a fantastic amount of work in the community, and we'll be looking to do even more in our community. These are tough times for many of people within our community in the UK, uh, and the club um, recognises fully the part it has to play in in supporting um, all aspects of our community uh, and and the different. Um, communities within uh, East London and out into where our, you know, a lot of our fan base is out into the Essex area and beyond. And building our fan base and looking after our fan base locally is important. We will also be introducing uh, some international supporter memberships uh, in the uh, in America, in Ireland, and uh, also in Australia. They were the three. They're the first of the three that we will be launching in the next few weeks. They were the three uh, overseas territories that our streaming data showed us were strongest, where we really want to, to build and make, um, make headway. So again, lots going on from a marketing point of view while we build the fan base, but it all comes back into sorting out and being better and matching the on-field performance with a much, uh, a much better financial performance, which we must have to do. We've had, I think the board will tell me, We've had years of continually making losses and we really now need to um, begin to eat into that. So that's going to happen from better processes, uh, better commercial activity, um, a lot better commercial activity, I have to say. That requires a degree of investment, which I'll touch on in a minute as well. Um, but I'm very, very confident with the staff we've got, with the backing of the board that you guys have, um, that we can achieve that. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but we will want to, we need to 
and we will make serious inroads into that over the next 12 months and then beyond. But let me just, <clears throat> I'll, I'll finish now by just quickly bringing you up to speed with what's going on around the stadium uh, during the close season. Uh, the biggest thing is obviously the pitch. Everyone has seen the video that the content guys have put out last week. So the hybrid pitch is being installed as part of our ongoing relationship with Spurs. Nigel has mentioned in the past that Spurs women, um, they had a tough year last year, as indeed did Spurs men. Uh, they struggled in their league on the field. They struggled with their attendances off the field, which was disappointing for us. Uh, the hybrid pitch and their commitment to it, I believe they've also made some changes internally. Everything seems to be changing at Spurs these days, but um, they recognise that they need to make a better fist of it. The hybrid pitch is clearly going to help them, but from our point of view, it will allow Martin, Richie, the players and the coaching staff to have a surface that they can really play the type of football that we want to see played, that we know can be successful and we know that the fans want to see as well. On top of that, it also opens up a host of commercial opportunities for us. One of them is obviously Spurs women being here and bringing additional revenue to the club but also a hybrid pitch, which is kind of five or six percent. It's a SIS pitch. Anybody wants to go and research it, SIS pitch. Five or six percent man-made turf, um, woven then obviously with natural grass. It's very robust. Um, we need to make sure we look after it well, which of course we will do. But it means that we can host events not only at the end of the season, but if the right opportunities present themselves, we can even look to host them during the season, which are... Other, a, a normal uh, pitch would not have allowed us to do without potentially damaging the pitch and obviously uh, the effect that would have on the on the football side. So the hybrid pitch is going to allow us to generate more commercial revenue, which as I said earlier, and Nigel's touched on, we need to significantly improve as we move forward. So the pitch is, uh, is, is ongoing. Um, one thing to tell you, to, just to say that isn't going to happen, is we've had to delay the upgrade to our PA system. That was all planned. Uh, again, without going into too much detail, unfortunately, the company that were booked in uh, and contracted to do it um, decided to fairly significantly increase the price at the last minute. And as a result, we we're going to be looking at doing other things with our PA system during the summer. And we've put a complete, um, at the installation of a completely new system uh, back by a year, whilst we focus our investment on other areas such as our hospitality areas, which will need to be upgraded completely. Um, our catering facilities, we have aspirations to produce much better food, not only for, in the concourses, but obviously to our hospitality clients. We've gone up a division. We've got some significantly, uh, we've got some really significant matches to look forward to next year. Um, and we want to be able to deliver uh, a much better product off the field in our hospitality areas and in our kiosks. Um, to our supporters and that includes doing some work over in the East Stand to improve the facilities over there. We are in discussions with the council about being able to close Brisbane Road and be able to use Brisbane Road as additional space because as we all know the East Stand until we decide what we're going to do with the East Stand um, is cramped. So some of the improvements in the Undercroft and the Concourse will help and that will also uh, help the, you know, the, the other facilities that we, have, uh, that we can offer there. And we'll also look to make it something akin to a fan zone as well for families and so forth on the basis that we are able to um, to shut the road down for a number of hours uh, uh, before the game. Um, we're also looking to do work on the South Stand Bar, which uh, is still a bit of a throwback to a bygone era. So we're looking to work with our touring rights partners to, um, to see what can be done there. Um, we continue to look at the uh, we, we continue to look at making some improvements in the retail area. We've seen we've been very successful retail performed really well last year. We need to increase the productivity, how quickly we can serve people, the range that of, of clothing that we have. So we're making some uh, further adjustments in the shop. We continue to have um, some really good discussions on a, a, a potential new training ground. Again, not able to really say where it is um, because discussions are ongoing. There are people involved that we need to keep that to ourselves for the moment. We need to keep our powder dry. But it is, it, for, for me personally, I think it's one of the, the things that we have to concentrate on. We do have to improve our, our training facilities for our first team and our academy and indeed the, uh, the women's team. So that's 
an ongoing search, but we have found an area, I've mentioned this before, that we are currently um, well down the line in terms of discussions, but there are still a number of hurdles to overcome. So that's still a big issue for us. I touched on the East Stand as well. For the moment, we're, we're just looking at options on the East Stand. It's going to be very, very expensive to um, even just to simply do a regut of the of the internal facilities of the East Stand would be expensive. A complete rebuild would would cost in the region of twenty to twenty five million pounds, um, and that's an awful lot of money when you're looking at a training ground, when you're looking at investing side of the business, you're looking at investing in uh, in the pitch and and the facilities in the stadium. So it's a it's an expensive um, it's an expensive job looking after and running a football club, which brings me on to to add my thanks to those of the board and everyone else for the fantastic response to season card sales. Um, we, we have stopped sales at just over 4,600, 4,625 to be exact, season card holders. Been a fantastic response. Um, we know it was, it was a difficult thing for us to communicate that our prices were going up in the way they did, but it was something we had to do and hopefully we managed to communicate, explain that to everyone. Uh, and the response has been magnificent. Um, and the, the rationale, just to, to give you a quick update, the rationale on capping season cards, because lots of fans have, have, well, fans have written to me to ask, well, surely we would want as many as possible. But we also need to protect our revenue on match days. Season cards are effectively a, a significant discount for people who are prepared to pay up front for the season. We actually also need to generate money on a match by match basis with people paying normal ticket prices. Um, so that's a fact of uh, it's just a business fact that we need to keep that avenue open to us and at the same time also make sure that we have tickets available for those fans that who, for whatever reason can't buy season um, and that uh, that I think gives you a hopefully uh, a quick update on the uh, off the field stuff that's uh, currently underway Mark thank you very much um... Any gossip from the EFL meeting that you could share with us all? Uh, Nigel, I think I've touched on it really. As I say, the, the gossip that I've had with a couple of the guys there was really about um, the 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 the, uh, the trouble that some clubs find themselves in. And obviously, the EFL have been, you know they've been able to position it as a premium tournament now. Uh, quite rightly, it is. The Premier League obviously gets all the plaudits, but the Championship, Leagues One and Leagues Two still get substantial viewing figures both domestically and abroad. It's uh, Sky see it as a premium product. They, they're investing in it not only in, in cash terms, but also in support terms. Um, and obviously the EFL are keen to, to not see clubs having these continual financial issues and clubs continually being docked points. It doesn't do the, the tournament and the championship uh, and the EFL any good. The Premier League are not people that believe in docking points, but I don't think the EFL have been unfair in some of the sanctions that they've applied. So, no, the, 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 um, there's more to come tomorrow. We're looking forward to grilling Howard Webb on the quality of refereeing and VAR and all sorts of things tomorrow morning. Um, but it's, it's been a, a good day so far. But I know something, and I touched on it, redistribution has been brought up uh, in the League One meeting and, and uh, the strategy for that. We do think it's the time, along with the EFL asking the Premier League to redistribute as well, Now's a good time to look at our own internal mechanism and uh, that process will start. OK, Mark, thank you. And for those who don't know, the basic distribution within the EFL is 80% goes to the Championship, 12% to League One and 8% to League Two. So by getting promotion in the money we get from the league, we, we went up 50%. So uh, we're hoping to try and uh, improve that, as Mark said. Right, we always like to make everything interactive at Lake Orient. So, as always, Luke will do a great job bringing forward your questions. And we had some before, and I'm sure we're going to have others. And I'm going to say, I know Simon's got to go, but we must finish, let's say, about 25, sorry, sorry, five minutes to the hour. Okay, so Luke, over to you, please. Yeah, no worries. Um, like I said earlier, people on the call um, want to pop some questions in as well. We'll, we'll try and get to them. Um, in the meantime, though, we've had some sent through in advance. Um, we'll start with one from Kevin Jordan. He said, what steps are the board planning to take to reduce the operating losses of Leighton Warrior Football Club? Um, well, uh, I think Mark's touched on a lot of this, but I think it's worth commenting that 
you know, I think he kind of was nice about it. I think we could improve our internal processes, which he did cover, but I think that's important. I think commercial, um, Mark, I think, has brought a new ethos to the comp to the club. We may have given some of our commercial opportunities away just so that people could be associated with us. That's going to be going to have a tougher edge and we're going to be more focused on it. I think it's also worth saying is we've got to maximise our assets, which really go from being the digital pitch side assets that Mark was very instrumental in bringing in last season, uh, the digital ad boards. Uh, we've also got our streaming products to, that we could commercialise, in my view, more. And then there's everything that Mark's just covered in terms of the fan-led review. So, Simon, uh, Mark, anything to add to that? Uh, the only thing I would add is obviously for the financial year just coming to a close, uh, the losses have actually increased. And uh, one of the reasons is obviously the investment we've had in, in the squad, which has produced the results that we, we achieved this year. And secondly, promotion bonus as a relatively large figure uh, that needs to be recognised in full in this financial year because that's the year that we got promoted. So uh, the operating losses do actually rise uh, quite a bit for next year, and then we'll see the, the benefits of the work that Mark has uh, previously outlined on cost reduction and revenue increases. Okay, thank you, Simon. Luke? Yeah, um, moving on to a question from Louis, who's asked, um, the success on the pitch has meant that a good number of matches in the past campaign were sold out, and there is an ever-present question as to the long-term future of Brisbane Road due to its capacity. Has the board explored any possible options for expansion or indeed moving to a new stadium? And if not, then what options are being considered? OK, so this is a tough one. I'll kick off and then Mark will follow up. Um, I, I think as I said before, our stadium holds effectively 8,800. Um, and we have probably more demand coming with all the new properties being built next to the stadium. So it is, a high, it is on one hand, a high-class problem. And I say high class problem because when we did the so called six year plan, one of our goals was to average attendances over 5,000. This year we're close to 8,000, no matter how you count it. And I think that shows how far we've come. And, and so that's an issue. Now, uh, I could spend two hours on this, but we need to look at the options inside the stadium. We need to think about, do we move within the local area? You then get into the fact that we're an East London club, and I think everyone can recognise the challenges there. So it's a tough process. I think in the foreseeable future, we need to think about we can't increase capacity. That doesn't mean to say we're not thinking about how we could do it. And Mark's got one or two ideas, but it's something that we have to keep researching. But don't expect an instant answer is my answer. Mark? Yeah, there's not a lot more to add, really, Nigel. It's uh, it's <clears throat> the the cost of a the cost of a new stadium in London um, is anything between three and a half thousand to six thousand pounds a seat. So if you take it at five thousand pounds a seat, if we went for a fifteen thousand stadium, which I think is the kind of aspiration personally I think we should be looking for, you're talking about seventy five million pounds, and the cost of it goes up pretty much every day with um, the cost of inflation. So it, it's not cheap. I've already touched on, we're looking at what we can do with the East Stand. Um, luckily we've got friendly, uh, we got friendly landlords. Um, and so there's, there's, I, I, I you know, we're, when uh, you and I have discussed this previously, Nigel, I think we are very clear that our routes are in East London. Um, I think we would love to be able to stay at Brisbane Road. Whether that's feasible or not is something that we will continue to assess. Uh, we need to make sure we get the business at the, in the round right. We need to make sure that we're attracting and marketing correctly so that we're filling the stadium as often as possible, irrespective of results. And that's always the biggest thing, you know, this whole adage of when you win games, your crowds go up. When you lose games, your crowds go down. Well, we've got to try and find a way of, of, of ensuring that we can level that out a little bit. There'll always be that emotional roller coaster. So um, it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. Uh, land in London is scarce, it's expensive. Uh, I think uh, you know, a stadium will cost 
upwards of 60, 70 million, perhaps as much as 100 million for, for a 15,000 uh, stadium with facilities that we can use every day of the week, so uh, every day of the week so that we can sweat the asset. So it is a tough issue. First and foremost, we need to continue to fill uh, Brisbane Road on a regular basis and we need to see what we can do to improve the facilities at, at Brisbane Road. Um, and then, and then we can, you know, we will obviously continue to keep one eye on what's uh, what's possible moving forward. Yeah, I think I'll just add one fact: is the EFL attendances across the board last year went up by twelve percent. So it shows that the sport is attracting even more attention. And I think most people agree that the quality in everything from the Premier League down has improved. So uh, it's a higher class problem, but it's a problem in terms of capacity. We're not going to resolve easily. Luke? Yeah, um, one from Gary. Obviously, we've talked a bit about the, the new deal from, from Sky for the rights for the games. Um, and he's asked, with the deal for Sky to screen more, uh, more lower league games from the 24-25 season, how does the board feel this would affect attendances versus match day income if a home game would move to, let's say, a Monday evening um, versus the income it would generate from Sky? In essence, what is more lucrative to the club? Keeping a Saturday 3pm kickoff or moving to a Monday for Sky? Okay, so I'll kick off with a very short sentence. The world is changing. I live in America. Games get changed at two weeks' notice over here in all sports. Um, I think the EFL is already committed to five weeks. So that's the reality. And if we need more money, we, we have to show some flexibility. But Mark, can you answer the specific question? Well, that, that kind of encompasses it, really. We, we know that, you know, football traditionally is, is three o'clock on a Saturday. That's been changing over the years, pretty much since the Premier League started. And they started to mess around with games in the Premier League. And that's obviously built down in the Football League. Um, Saturday afternoons will always uh, will always be when people feel that they we will get our best attendances. We will have to deal with Monday night games if that's what happens, as and when the games, uh, you know, uh, Sky decide which games they're going to uh, to stream and show and and so forth. It is a uh, the new TV deal does bring more money into the EFL. It brings more money into the clubs. We were one of the clubs that. Um, had really invested in streaming and that was showing with some of the results that we were achieving ourselves, Bradford, two or three others had really invested. Other clubs have decided to do very little. So the new deal is probably slightly better for them than it is for clubs like us that, that, us that had big aspirations in terms of streaming. But it does undoubtedly bring more money into the Football League. Um, and, and in the round, that's what the commercial team of the Football League have been charged with doing. So... We will have to work hard to make sure that our match day experience is so good that people will want to come on a Monday night um, uh, irrespective. And so that our match day experience is something that we are working very hard to improve. Whatever night of the week, whatever afternoon we're playing, we are looking to, to make Brisbane Road a great place to come and watch football and a great place to, to, to have a night out with friends, family, colleagues, whatever. And that's, uh, that's not only a challenge for us, but for all football clubs. We, we, particularly are going to pick up the baton with that moving forward. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, um, I think this is another one from Gary, actually. He said, of all the directors listed on the accounts for 22-23, which ones are actual shareholders and which ones, if any, are directors in name only? OK, everyone everyone who's on the accounts is a director. They all own shares. And just to remind you, they're shareholders of Eagle Investments 2017 Limited, which owns 90.4% of the club so there are true directors no independent directors and i think it's worth saying and i may have said this last year the club at some stage has to bring in a true um a truly independent director with uh, some kind of diversity so that's something that we talk about regularly luke next please yeah um probably this one probably should have followed on from the previous one um but it's just asking for a bit of clarity in regards to the TV deal um, and how that affects the streaming service. Um, obviously, Mark, you mentioned it a little bit, but um, if you can maybe give a bit more clarity on that one. Let me go first. Uh, I think every, this coming year, everything will be as is. And I want to remind everyone, piracy is a bad thing for football, bad for the EFL and bad for Leighton Orient. Um, the following year, we will effectively lose our streaming domestically because 
all games will be available one way or another outside the three o'clock kickoff on the on a Sky app. Um, international should not change. Um, thank God. Um, and um, so that's the issue. But I think it's worth saying. Back to the earlier question, I th I think you should expect games on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday. Okay, actually, it may not be Sunday. Yeah, it is Sunday and Monday. It's kind of the way that football is going. It's the way that American sports have gone. So that's you will be able to see EFL games five nights a week or five days a week. Um, okay, continuing on um, with the questions. Andy's asked, if championship level football is the ambition, how far away currently are we in terms of infrastructure and finance from being able to both realise and sustain that ambition? Okay, so why don't we kick off with Mark and then Matt, who had the experience of nearly getting in the championship 10 years ago. He can follow up. So, Mark? Uh, so, we... we um... Uh, from an infrastructure point of view, from a staffing point of view, uh, we would need to staff up in in certain key areas, broadcast, media, things like that. The demands in the championship uh, because of the amount of live games um, is such that we would need to improve our media facilities and probably the, the number of staff that we have and the skill sets that we have as, a, as an organisation. Uh, I'm pleased to say that from a, from a staffing infrastructure, we're not a million miles away from it. We wouldn't have to suddenly double the size of our organisation in any way, shape or form. Um, there are areas that we would need to improve and the extra uh, money coming in from the championship would certainly help us do that. Um, but that's mainly up business systems and, and things like that. I'd love to see big screen at the, at the club um, and at the right time, I think we will, uh, we will probably look to invest in a big digital screen as well because we need to improve our digital assets uh, because that's what commercial customers are, are desperate for, which is why we introduced the, the ad board. So um, we're not too far away from it. The stadium is an issue because we, you know, as we've seen last year, we simply can't fit any more people into our stadium. So we're going to have to think of creative ways of generating more money, not only on match days, but on non-match days as well. That that comes into, into play. And um, we'll need to think long and hard about, uh, about that, about, what we do with the shop, but our shop is a good size now. It's a lot bigger than many clubs in the championship. We just need to make sure we've got the systems and the uh, the range to, to satisfy the demand of our supporters. So we're not a million miles away, uh, and then we'll obviously have a hybrid pitch to boot as well for the players to, to utilise, and not every championship club has one of those as well. So we will be in, in good shape, but um, we have a long way to go to, to attain that. There's lots of hard work to be done before then. Matt? Yeah, I think, as Mark says, there's, there's um, certain infrastructure improvements that, that should and, and could be made in order for us to, to be viable at that level. But the key would be for me that we were ready to be at that level and not just go up and waste the effort that had been put into getting to that level and by coming straight back down again, because there is a huge gulf in football and quality between League One and the Championship. And if you look at when... As you referenced, Nigel, we nearly did it nine years ago. That, Although we had an outstanding season that year, what we did that year wasn't because of what we did that year. It was because of what we'd done over the previous four years in building to, to get into that point. And whilst I'm not saying I'd ever turn down the prospect of us going straight up to the championship, I think if we were to do it in three, four years' time, we'd actually be a lot more ready for it on and, and off the pitch uh, than perhaps if we were to do it straight away. Um, it's my personal opinion. I may be proven wrong, and I'm, and I'm happy to be if if we were fortunate enough to have an excellent season in League One this season coming. But I think it's important that, in the same way that now we're in League One and we don't want to be back in League Two again for a while, if we end up in the Championship, we don't want to be back in League One again for a while. So we have to make sure that every aspect of the club is ready to not only achieve promotion but then sustain the level that we've reached. Thank you, Luke. Um, Pete asked, given the size of some of the away clubs due to visit Brisbane Road this season, is there any likelihood of home fans in the East Stand being moved to accommodate them, as happened during Barry Hearn's reign? Oh, well, they, they had a very different CEO then. But anyway, you want me to um, answer that one as well? No, 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 no. We'll let you off that one. Um, you, 
You'll probably get some abuse if you do. Um, so, Mark. It's all right. It's never changed. It never it won't stop me again. <laughs> From my point of view, just to, well, Matt just there is blushes there for a second. Um, uh, so uh, the simple answer to that would be from a financial point of view, uh, the board should quite rightly say to me, Mark, when the likes of Derby, Portsmouth, Charlton, whatever, come over, give them the whole East stand and um, make hay while the sun shines. And from, from, a, from a purely financial point of view, that would be absolutely the right decision to, to do. Um, my, my position currently, and, and I've expressed it to the board, uh, is that we have a number of East Stand season card holders who like the, the East Stand and all its vagaries. Um, and if we're going to be serious about building this club and taking it forward and building our fan base locally, domestically, internationally, and so forth, then handing over half the stand. And you know, from a, from a footballing point of view, it'd be interesting to see what Lingy would say about this. But, um, if the, when the East Stand's packed full of uh, visiting fans, I think it takes away something that Brisbane Road takes away that home advantage because we're looking to improve the um, the experience at Brisbane Road. I want it to be even tougher for clubs to to visit Brisbane Road, like and to fear coming to Brisbane Road, not thinking that they're going to come here and have you know a third of the stand under the uh, under the acoustics that the East Stand gives them, you know, making an awful lot of noise. So. In short, in an ideal world, I would like us to uh, back ourselves to fill the East Stand, keep things as the status quo, fill the East Stand area with home fans and continue to limit the visiting fans to sort of 1,250 seats. Um, yeah. Our job is to, is, to market, is to market that and to make sure that we get our relationship with the fan base right, that the fans will come and back us and we'll fill the East Stand. Otherwise, it will make, give me a difficult decision to make. Yeah, I just think from a, a footballing point of view, totally agree. I just think if people can turn their mind back to 05, 06, when Oxford give us a complete stand wrongly on that day and we had 4,000 odd supporters and we was louder than the, the own fans, I just think if we give the OE stand to anybody, it would give the team that we're playing against an advantage on a football point of view. So it's totally from football-wise... I would. I wouldn't want it done if we, if at all possible. Just grant me ten seconds on this one, Nigel. There's one fundamental difference between the club now and the club then. We've now got four thousand six hundred season ticket holders. Back then, we didn't ever have really more than three three thousand one hundred season ticket holders at the most. So, um, certainly one of the years when we were displacing people from the east stand, it was never more than a hundred hundred and fifty season ticket holders who who were over there, and it was relatively straightforward to do. Now, with the number of season ticket holders that we've got, uh, I mean, Mark and Lindsay will will know way better than me, but I would imagine it would be an extremely challenging job to relocate everyone who's committed to being in the east stand in their groups to somewhere else within within the stadium. Um, so I think that's that's an important factor. At the time, we weren't selling out the home ends. We needed the revenue from the away fans. They used to bring about £100,000 a game with them and we, we had to make a difficult decision. But fortunately, we're in a better place now. Yeah, just so the fans know the, the numbers, the total capacity, let's say it's 8-8. Eight, eight. The away fan section is about 1,300. So that takes you down to 7-5. If we've now got 4,650 season tickets, that leaves us with about 3,000 tickets or a bit less than that to sell. So we have to keep thinking what's right commercially, what's right from an atmospheric point of view. And a plea I'd make to all fans, if you can't come and you're a season ticket holder, we're going to do a more aggressive deal this year where you can sell your ticket and we can resell it because we want as many people in the stadium who support Leighton Orient as we can get. Thank you, Nigel. Um, got about five minutes or so, so try and get for a couple more. Um, what was that Martin with us? So one for Martin um, from Ray was, what date do the players who have been offered new contracts have to notify the club of their intentions? Uh, that's this Saturday, the 10th. Uh, we give the offers on the 10th of uh, May. So the 10th of June is the cut-off date. Obviously, there's been conversations going on in the meantime, but... It's a very familiar situation. Uh, this first month is a bit of jostling, people deciding 
are they going to stay or they're not going to stay? And I always turn it back to when I was a footballer myself, and it's exactly what I did. So I don't hold any anything against any of our players or anybody else's players. They're just trying to, to see what's the best for them. It's a process that we go through. On Saturday, we know who wants to be with us going forward and who, who isn't. Obviously, as a uh, football department, we're actively doing recruitment meetings every couple of days. Uh, there's a recruitment WhatsApp group that goes on every single day. Uh, and, and there's an awful lot going on. And we're covering all eventualities. We're, we're covering the offer. We're covering the, you know, the four main players, I think, is, is, is the ones that we feel that may not stay with us in terms of uh, Beckel, Zappi, Smith and Vigaru. But we're covering ourselves in terms of that we make sure that we've got people in, in them areas if they choose not to sign. But the one thing I would add, and everybody needs to know this, the contracts that have been handed out to them players are the best football, best contracts that this football club's ever given out, certainly in the last six years. So we know that we've got a competitive budget. We know that we're putting a, a, a good offer across. I'm very comfortable with the budget that we've been given. And if it isn't... The, the one big problem you get from being successful and winning leagues is people take notice of the players and manager and anybody else that you've got. So that's the downside of it. So your players are, are you know, they may be well uh, be more sought after than they would be if you wasn't the league champions of League Two. So it's a process. Look, I don't, if I'm honest, I don't lose a lot of sleep over it. There's no point. We will, I hope all four of them players sign and we move forward. Uh, but if they don't, we will move forward uh, with a competitive budget and, and very comfortable in that department. But, yeah, as I, same happened to us when we went out in the National League and we lost people like Bon and Karoma. It can happen, uh, and you have to be ready. And the main thing you have to be doing is if you, you've got to be ready and ready to go with the replacements if then people ain't going to stay for you. But uh, uh, I know at this moment in time, as much as you do, Saturday is the cutoff date. They all know that, and there's got to be a definite decision by on Saturday that we that, that we move on to other areas if they're not going to stay, or if they do stay, we still need to fetch other players in any way. Uh, and people will then will start. You start to see players that will start to sign contracts going between this Saturday because we're one of the earliest ones because we got out and out very quickly. Uh, maybe it's semi semi quiet for another week, and then you'll see all the signings start to happen. So it, it's a process that we've been through many times, and experience tells me to be patient, let the process be the process, but make sure you're ready for whatever the eventuality is that you've got to deal with. Luke, let's make this a spellbinding question. Okay, yeah, pressure. All right, we'll go with this one from Colin. Um, quite blue sky thinking, as as they say. Um, and he said, my question is, if we were ever to emulate Luton and get to the Premier League in due course, how much funding would be required and could the current board cope? Presumably, additional investors would be required. But has this question even been considered at this stage? OK, so it's not impossible. So the other day I looked at Luton. They were in the National League for four years. They went to League Two. I think they were there for two years. But then they went from League Two to League One and League One to the Championship in consecutive years. I think they were in the Championship, someone help me, five years, was it? Something like that. It's so Three years, Marshall. Yeah, okay. So, so it's not impossible. And to be honest, it's not impossible to go up twice, even though I think it's highly unlikely. I want to remind everyone some numbers. The Championship clubs lose at the moment an average of 18 to 20 million a year. So think about that per week. So that's a lot of money. So that's probably a bigger challenge than being in the Premier League. The Premier League, you know, Luton got the so-called 170 million, which I think includes parachute payments if they go down. There's, as I understand it, 10 million to be spent doing all the things that we talked about earlier in terms of upgrading the facilities. Um, I think the, the bigger issue is how we finance the championship. Now, it's interesting. One club who will remain nameless uh, actually made a profit in the championship. They went up and came straight down. Uh, and the reason they made money is, remember that 80-12-8 split? 
you effectively get six and a half times the money you get in League One. So if you really go tight on your playing budget, you can make money in the championship, but that won't help you get to the Premier League. So it's a complex question. And I think rather than giving ourselves a lot of brain ache, we are focused on building, as several people said, steadily over the next two to three years. And by the way, Richie fully understands this and buys into it. And for everyone to be clear, we didn't come up with these goals without talking to Martin in detail, Richie in detail. So everyone's on the same page. It's not like we're saying to Richie, hey, this is the plan. He buys into it, so he understands it. We've got to build up, consolidate, try and be successful in um, League One. And by the way, just a reminder for Martin, wouldn't mind a cup run or two. Um, (laughs) And uh, I think that helps our finances and helps us prepare for all the things that Mark talked about. So that's my answer. Um, I'd say the chances are like 3% it could happen in the next few years. But what I would say in American sports, a certain team had 3% chance of going to the NBA finals and made it. So things do happen. Okay, so with that, Luke, thanks for bringing in all the questions. Thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you for all your support of Leighton Orient. This is kind of our uh, midsummer get together. We're looking forward to seeing a few people in Spain. I won't be there. And a few people back at Brisbane Road. Thank you. We've had a great year. We're moving on and we're going to have another good year. Thank you and have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye, all.